Hello. 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 I'm Dan. Um, I'm from Innocent. Um, I'm going to be taking you through this evening. It is the final uh, session of our Innocent Inspires evenings. Uh, number five, saving the most important and mysterious till last. Uh, so creativity, creativity. Um, and the question, the question in, on our lips tonight is where do good ideas come from? Uh, that train, probably, that is rumbling in the background. Um, we've got five amazing sets of people to, uh, to show you, I don't know, some completely different ideas tonight. I'm not even going to bother trying to explain what they all are, uh, because one, hopefully you've had a little read about them, and two, they will do a much better job than I could of telling you what it is they think and how they do what they do. Um, so we'll get to those people shortly. And actually, after this bit, we've got something pretty special happening on these microphones. We were thinking that there were two people who were going to engage in the art of flute boxing. Um, but now there are four people, and it will include poetry. So I have absolutely no idea how that's going to work. But the gents, Nathan and Biscuit and his friends, uh, tell us that it's going to be magic. So that's coming up in a sec. Um, I thought it would be relevant, seeing as it's an innocent event, and we're talking about creativity, to talk about innocent and creativity. Uh, my job at Innocent is I'm the head of creative things. So I've been innocent since we started the business in 1999. So, so how innocent looks and how innocent sounds is, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, my fault. Um, so blame me or, or love me, as you, as you wish. Uh, it definitely was, there was more laughing than, than loving there. Um, so, so this, so, so bottles that wear hats. Um, if I'd thought that when I was at school, that was one of the things that, you know, like what did that, what did that guy do? What did, he do, what did he do before he died? Oh, yeah, he was involved with that thing where the woolly hats were on the bottles. I was, you know, if I, even if I, if I think about it today, I'm hoping for bigger things in the future. <laughs> I'm, ho I'm hoping for grander things. But still, if I try to explain to people what I do, then it's probably easiest just to show them this picture. Um, now, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I write stuff. So, you know, Innocent's known for writing funny stuff on labels. So that's, so I'm a writer. Um, I'm a creative director. People talk about creativity, and so creativity needs a needs a director, apparently. So I'm a creative director, but I don't really, I don't really, I don't really know what they are. But um, that sounds a bit better when I'm telling people what I do. Um, a design director. So we do lots of design, but I have absolutely no background or training in design. Yet I walk around all the time going, "Yeah, move that, make that bigger." Uh, kerning. I've learned what that word means. Leading. I've learned what that word means. And so I can sort of just about get away with being a designer. Boss. I'm boss. I'm, a bit, I'm, I'm not like boss, like a scouser. I'm not that boss. But I'm a, I'm a boss. Uh, so I boss other people around who are far more talented at being creative and designing stuff. But I, tr I try and figure out how uh, you could assemble a group of people to do that stuff really well. Uh, and at the bottom, the most important bit, just find people who are loads smarter than yourself, loads more creative than yourself. And, and increasingly younger. Um, that's very important as well. Um, so I don't know, is Innocent a creative business? Um, we kind of, we've kind of, uh, well, we've, we've said that we are. We've put on an evening about creativity. I guess we're trying to, in a really subtle but yet unsubtle way, saying, well, yeah, we're a creative business. Um, so where does it start? Well, some of it starts with this. Um, so, before Innocent was called Innocent, this was what Innocent was, fast tractor smoothies. Um, this is actually a label design pre-Innocent pre becoming Innocent. Um, really good, yeah? <laughs> so, so would Innocent be here today? Would Innocent be you know, a quarter of a billion pound business operating in 14 countries if we had stayed with that? Any, any thoughts? <laughs> any thoughts? Any? No, no, yes, yes, no? No. No, thanks, Kate. Um, probably not. Although, you never know. Maybe that would have been the thing. Uh, but pro probably not. Um, yeah, come on. You see what I'm doing? Man with the computer, you got it there? Yeah, good. 
Um, this, you won't be able to read this, but this is probably the most creative thing we've ever done. It's a spreadsheet. <laughs> uh, it's a spreadsheet from 1999. This is how we chose the name Innocent. Um, so you'll see down the left this list of names that we got from a thesaurus, because this is just about pre-internet. So I had to actually look in a book and get, the, get this name, these names out of a thesaurus. And there are some terrible names there. There's like Love Apple and, uh, and Hula Hula and Bambino and all these names that probably wouldn't have worked. But hidden away in there is Innocent. And, that's, and it was chosen on these, this bad set of criteria. And luckily, uh, Innocent was the name we chose. And, you know, I think, I think if you think about creativity and the way it works, is it's, all, it's a set of all these little decisions and accidents that happen. And they, they just, I don't know, they either turn out right or wrong. But choosing Innocent was a, was a great accident for us uh, that, that meant that good things happened afterwards. Um, and I guess where some of that stuff uh, appears and became apparent was on the side of a bottle, written there, hidden away, uh, little stories about, about rubbish, just about the stuff that normal people think about every day. Um, and I think if people talk about innocent being creative, maybe, maybe that's what they're referring to, the fact that we, that we talk to people in a, in a language that seems natural and human um, and not forced and not of a business. So, this question, right? And I know the whole evening is based around answering this question, but I thought I'd just get it out of the way and answer it for you. Um, because, um, although I'd like to rely on these guys to be able to answer it, I haven't heard what they're going to say, and they, m may maybe it's not going to happen. So I thought I'd try have a go myself. Um, um, and it's where, I guess it's quite personal, right? It's where, where do I think the ideas have come from for Innocent, and ultimately, where have they come from for me? Uh, so I'm gonna, this is going to be quick. It's going it's to be. I'm going to try and whiz through this, and um, some of it might not make any sense, but I think that's okay. Um, so some of it comes from the people you hang around with. So both these blokes are called Richard. Uh, one is Richard on the left, and one is called Richard on the right. Um, Richard on the left was uh, one of the chaps who started Innocent. So an old friend from university, and when I sit in a room with him, we have good ideas together. And I've tried to sit in rooms with lots of other people, and it always works differently. <clears throat> but I know that when we started in, I used to sit in a room with him, we would be able to come up with really stupid ideas together. And uh, quite importantly, as a founder, he was allowed to say, yeah, let's do that as well. So that, that really helped. Um, Richard on the right worked and still works at an advertising agency. And he'd already had lots of ideas for other people. Um, and I used to just take my really rubbish early ideas to him and go, what do you think of that? And he used to say, that's shit. Um, and that was really important as well, because uh, without him, I would have thought maybe that all my ideas were good, and I needed, I needed an editor or a coach or a guide. So, these so having friends who will help you, I think, is really important. Um, you have to click with your eyes. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I click with my fingers, and then I look at that man, and I don't know what he's... Then he's doing something else. But then when I look at him, he presses the button. Is that what's happening? Yeah, I think that's what's happening. Um, but, but now you take, yeah, stick with them. They're hippies. I don't know. I, I read a lot of books about hippies when I was a kid. I was, I was intrigued. And, um, and I, like the, I like the way that hippies had ideas and made them happen. And if they wanted to go march somewhere and protest against something, then they kind of did it. If they, wanted, if they wanted to sit naked in the park, they did that too. If they wanted to have a festival, then they did that too. And... and and I don't know, when, when, when you're a kid, I think, is when you form your ideas and form your opinions. And I, I liked the way they did things. Now, in North Kent, where I lived, there weren't that many hippies. Um, and if you look like a hippie, then you just usually got a kicking. But um, I, I kind of, obviously, I've persevered a bit. And it's not, it's not doing me any favours, because what I'm told is this beard puts about 10 years on me. Um, but I'm, I'm still trying. I'm still trying to find a tribe of people who actually are in a park dancing like this. Um, that might help me have great ideas. If you see them, let me know. Um, space. Uh, I've, I've always loved space. I think, I think we all like space, generally. It's quite difficult to find people who don't like I really don't like space. Uh, most, people, most people like it. I like it as a concept. I like it as a, as, a, as a place for thinking. I haven't been there, but I like to try and put myself there. Um, 
And, and, and I think that the possibilities of it, it being infinite, means that you can have loads of ideas when you, when you stick, your, stick your head into it, when you stick your brain into maybe a uh, metaphorical space, if not actually that part of space. Um, I told you it wasn't going to make any sense, but it does, it does to me, and that's, that's the important thing. Um, this, these two, when I was a kid, these two were really important at, at helping me uh, be creative, I think. Oh, this is Saturday morning TV, and this was, this was like a, this was a, a nationally unifying, bonding moment, I think, for people of a certain age. Um, and obviously, um, bad fashion and stuff. But on the left was Tizwas, where kids got to abuse grown-ups. And that was really important. Basically, you used to put the grown-ups of the day in a cage and throw stuff at them. And I, I, I still, there's not enough of that on TV anymore. And, and, on, the, and on the right were these, uh, these two uh, and some other people. But, the, but eBay was born on Swap Shop where you, if you had rubbish toys, you could phone up and swap them for good ones live on TV. And I, I liked that sort of, um, that instant bartering thing as well. And the anarchy of those TV programmes. No one ever really knew what was going to happen. Um, music. Um, reading the enemy every Wednesday or Thursday morning, whenever it was, like getting that through my letter, letterbox. Sm like I can remember the smell of that newspaper, and I used to read, used to read the journalists who were writing in there, and really want to be them. Really love the stories they wrote. They were they were in some sort of glamorous world of, usually somewhere called the De Montfort Hall in Leicester, and um, watching a band. And I think oh, that'd be really good to go and see the Pastels in in the De Montfort Hall in, in Leicester. Um, um, but but it was, again, it was this otherworldliness and, and, a, and, a, and a group of people who were just doing something because they loved it, and I, and I loved reading their stuff. Um, and... Go on, there you go. And then, then having a good old rave. <laughs> having a good old dirty rave. Um, I think after, after the enemy bit, then, then came uh, where, where I lived in, in Kent and North Kent, a lot of parties in fields that we used to go to. And again, the, the spirit of people just, the spirit of those parties happening with, with no real organisation, but somebody would put a tent up and then a sound system would appear and then a load of people would appear and then you'd have a party for two or three days. That, that thing happening out of the blue, especially when you're kind of 17 or 18, that was very, very special. And... Um, you know, I remember on some occasions, even the farmers would come out and join in because they were like, what, is, this looks like a laugh. And it's technically my field also. <laughs> um, uh, and I, I, you know, I, you, can't, um, you can't underestimate, I think, um, the, uh, well, probably how good those people look. Um, I'm always, actually, just, it's, just a, it's just an aside, but you see this girl on the left? Do you think they're, like, they're painted on eyes? Or they, re or they realise. I've just been trying to figure that out from that picture, but I don't know. But back then, you know, maybe, maybe people had painted on eyes. Um, yeah, I, to I told it wasn't going to make sense, but that's, that's kind of... If, if I'm trying to think about what makes uh, innocent sound the way it sounds or look the way it looks, that they're some of the things that, that, that are sort of... that go through the filter, I think. And every person who comes at work in isn't obviously brings their own set of influences and their own set of filters. Um, and then they have to put it through mine, which obviously makes everything awful. Um, but, but I think in trying to define what makes innocent creative, that's about as good as it's going to get. Um, we, we tried writing a book about it about three years ago, and that was really difficult, because then you have to sound grown up and knowledgeable about it. And I think that's when, I think that's when it that's when it dies, when you have to really theorise about these things and, and strategize about them, because that's a load of bollocks. Um, anyway, that's probably enough of that. Um, I think it would be good at this point. Oh, those two, I forgot about those two, sorry. Does anyone know who they are? Pete and Dud, Pete and Dud as Derek and Clive. So, as Derek, so when Pete and, Dud, Pete and Dud were too drunk to be Pete and Dud, they turned into Derek and Clive. And then it just got really rude. And so that's the, that's the naughty end of things. Have anyone heard Derek and Clive tapes? Have you, have you heard them? They're really, really sweary and disgusting. Um, it's probably not a good thing to... Is this, this is on film, right, about innocent. OK. We'll, we'll take that bit out later. Um, and, oh, and, and, and. Well, this, this, this will lead us into the music nicely. So, you know who these people are? You know who these people are? The Beastie Boys, and, but the looming, the looming figure in the background is the one I'm interested in. 
So it's, it's this man now. So that's Rick Rubin, right? That's Rick Rubin, the world's most successful record producer. The, th the thing I like about Rick Rubin is, apart from basically discovering LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys and reinventing Johnny Cash and um, producing Adele's uh, album um, and, and Kanye West's uh, last, last album, uh, he's the world's greatest record producer and he still doesn't know how to operate the machinery, the boards, the, the, the tools of his trade. And I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm in awe of that. How has he made it from, from there, from New York, from his dorm room, making the Beastie Boys' first album, to uh, paddle boarding off of Malibu, which is, I believe, what he does now, uh, running Columbia Records until a couple of years ago, and, and still doesn't really know how to, how to operate the machine, but he, do, but he does it better than anyone else, somehow. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of, I, I've got a lot of respect for that still uh, myself, not knowing what I'm doing as well. Um, so from Rick Rubin to, to that again, we go back to space. Um, I'm, I, wanted, I want to introduce now some men who are standing in the archway, which means you have to look at them. Um, Nathan Flutebox Lee and Biscuit and, and, mis and, and a couple of mystery chaps they've brought with them who are going to do something now that I don't think any of the rest of us can do. Um, I'm not even going to bother explaining what it is because they're going to show you. Thank you, Nathan. No, I'm not sure. Off you go.